Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sandro Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome to today's seminar. Before we begin, I would like to thank our team behind this seminar, Meredith Brown, Alicia Noel, and many colleagues who worked quickly to put together today's event, and particularly responding to sort of the changing world and the changing ways in which we're de delivering our uh, public content. It is, I'm not saying anything new by saying we live in unsettling times. Since it was first detected in Wuhan, Hubei, China, the novel coronavirus, which recently became COVID-19, has been seen worldwide, and it's now pandemic. We have become accustomed to checking the status of the virus's spread and to wondering about the changes it may bring in our day-to-day -day lives. The situation remains in flux, to put it mildly, and as we learn more about COVID-19 and how to address it. When such challenges emerge, I think it's important to take a measured approach, guided by data, working with our best scientists and scholars, such as those on today's panel. Now is the time for public health to provide leadership and clarity. We see it as our role as a school to bring together the best minds to collectively address this epidemic and other challenges to health, and ultimately to do that to change the conversation on health. I am very much looking forward to learning from today's conversation and to learn what we can all do to stay healthy in the coming months and what we can expect in the world ahead. Today's event is the brainchild of our moderator, Dr. Pat Hibbard, who is the chair of our Department of Global Health and Professor of Medicine and Infectious Diseases at uh, the BU School of Medicine. I'm going to turn this, over, this event over to Pat, who will lead us through the rest of the event. Professor Hibbard. Thank you and welcome uh, to uh, this session. Clearly, we're going to be learning a lot about coronavirus, so I'm not going to waste any uh, time uh, with any other comments, but uh, get right to introducing our speakers. And I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our first uh, speaker, Rita Nieves, who has had more than 35 years of experience as a nurse and a social worker, as well as a public health administrator. And she is our interim executive director of the Boston uh, Public Health Commission. She will be speaking to us today on the city and state's response to the COVID-19 outbreak. Rita, please. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, uh, talking a little bit about how Boston is preparing and has been preparing to respond to this um, public health um, emerging uh, situation that we've been dealing with uh, for a couple of months now. Uh, as um, our moderator said, I, uh, I'm the ex um, interim executive director at the Boston Public Health Commission, which is the city health department. And uh, I'll be talking to you today about um, what we've been doing for the last couple of months, uh, specifically in the city of Boston. You know, we know that, you know, COVID-19 um, has been uh, an emerging issue that has been evolving rapidly. Um, not only in Asia and in Europe, but also in the United States. And um, we have been uh, uh, in, in a preparedness mode since uh, the beginning of January. Um, as a public health department, you know, one of our uh, core functions is to respond to situations such as this. And we have the experience of having um, had the opportunity to respond to other uh, emerging issues such as the H1N1, Ebola, MERS, SARS. We've also, um, you know, were involved in responding to the uh, special events such as, you know, the Boston Marathon and the Boston bombings of 2013, and uh, extreme weather emergencies such as the uh, Hurricane Maria and um, and the evacuation that had to happen in in Puerto Rico. I'm going to give you all of our slides are dated these days and timed because, you know, in, indeed this situation keeps evolving and changing rapidly. Uh, and uh, the numbers I'm going to share with you, you know, are changing as, as I, you know, stand here and, um, and uh, quote you numbers. But um, as of today, um, there are about 124, uh, 913 cases uh, of COVID-19 globally. In the U.S., about 1,100, and in Massachusetts, 95. Um, and this are, and in Boston, uh, we have uh, 19 cases, one confirmed, and 18 presumed uh, cases of COVID-19. 
and we call them uh, uh, presumptive cases because they still need to be confirmed by, by the lab at CDC. So um, I just want to give you a quick uh, overview of what's going on in Massachusetts. Um, since January 2020, uh, 10, uh, 1,083 people have been subject to self-quarantine in Massachusetts. Um, and there are uh, currently about 638 uh, who have completed m monitoring that goes with that, and 445 that remain under quarantine. In Boston, we've had to do that work as well, so, so you have the, um, uh, a sense of what's the difference between following, following up uh, confirmed cases and following up, uh, following up people who are in quarantine. These are individuals that uh, travel from level three and level two countries in the past and uh, were channeled to the 11 airports that were doing uh, screening and then uh, allowed to travel to their final destination, in this case, Boston, and um, the State Department of Health would give us their names and it would be up to the local health departments to follow them up, make sure that they don't develop um, any symptoms and if they do, that we help them get the, the care that they need. February 1st of this year, it was uh, the time that we confirmed the, the first case of COVID-19 in Boston uh, on a resident that was returning from China. So in many ways, so we were one of the, the first five cities in the US to get a case uh, pretty early on. We had already been working on preparedness activities for about three weeks when that happened. And um, in a way, you know, it gave us the opportunity to, to really uh, step up our efforts because, you know, we got a case right away and, um, and we've been able to, um, to take advantage of, of, of that early warning for us. Um, since uh, February 28, DPH began testing for COVID-19 at the state laboratory, so that has made obviously a difference for us as opposed to having to send uh, tests to, um, to the CDC. Uh, on March 6, um, uh, MDPH announced um, a COVID-19 exposure at, at a Biogen conference, and I'm sure you all have been following this in the media, and uh, as a result of that um, uh, incident, our cases in Boston jumped from one uh, case to 18 additional uh, presumptive cases, all related to, um, to the exposure that happened during that conference. I, um, I like to, when I'm talking these days about this, I, I like to um, talk a little bit about uh, the Boston profile so we all remember and put this situation into context uh, because our profile obviously is different from other cities, um, whether they're large or small. And, um, and, and it, I, I know it helps me keep into perspective, you know, um, what are the things, you know, the, the limits of, of the things that we can do to control um, COVID-19 get into uh, our cities and, and communities. In, um, in Boston right now, we have about 695,000 uh, uh, residents. During the daytime, our population uh, though uh, increases to 1.2 million, uh, million individuals, and, and obviously that includes people who are coming uh, into the city to work and to, uh, to visit. Um, we have about 230,000 people that commute into Boston every day. And uh, in January, this is data from Massport, 1.5 million passengers deplane at Boston Logan International Airport. Um, and these are people who came to the city from all over the world, world and, um, you know, to visit or to stay and, um, and, and you know, big flow of um, individuals into, into our communities. We have 31 colleges and un universities in Boston, and we roughly have about 138,000 uh, students in, in our universities. Uh, we have large industries, healthcare, social assistance, uh, and we're, uh, we have the second largest um, science and technology um, network of industries. Part of our assets and, and, and infrastructure um, and we have, you know, a, a quite extensive public health and healthcare infra infrastructure that uh, we utilize for consistent preparedness planning and res response um, of various natures, including, you know, extreme weather and large event planning. Is the fact that we have a, a public health agency. You know, we are the oldest uh, public health department in, in the country. We have 1,100 employees, 40 programs. 
Uh, we have an infectious disease bureau that's just dedicated to, to do this, this, doing this kind of work. We have 20 licensed uh, hospitals, six level one trauma centers, 12 with acute care uh, services, a network, a very strong network of 22 community health centers. Um, we have a very uh, strong and um, nationally recognized uh, EMS system that happens to be uh, part of the Department of Health. And we also have an expansive long-term care, home health, specialty care, and mental health ne network of providers. So these are um, many of the assets that we have to deal with, um, with COVID-19. And we're gonna need you know, every, every all those partners to be uh, at the table. Our timeline, uh, so you have an idea um, of what's been happening. Uh, January 24, um, we issued the first advisory to the community of healthcare providers announcing and letting them know uh, um, what was going on in China and uh, what, what were the things that they need to start paying attention to. Um, we, we implemented the incident command structure uh, to help us, um, internal in incident command structure to help us uh, uh, begin planning and preparedness uh, and being re in preparing for a response. We held the first press conference where we announced uh, to residents, you know, the mayor held this conference uh, along with us so we could let people know what was going on and begin to provide um, education and information to, um, to our residents. We announced the first case of COVID-19 on February 1st and um, followed by additional, uh, an additional uh, press conference so we could alert people that we had identified the first case and what we were doing uh, to follow up on that. And um, we began developing communication materials, fact sheets, uh, flyers, um, all types of educational materials um, so we could uh, post in our, in our website so we could begin doing outreach education um, and uh, media outreach um, uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, February 28, we uh, announced that um, the state uh, lab could, be, could begin doing COVID-19 testing in Massachusetts. And um, March 6 um, was when we announced that um, the Biogen uh, conference had, had led to uh, an exposure in, in additional cases, both uh, in Boston and in other uh, counties in Massachusetts. And on uh, March 10, the governor, uh, Governor Baker, announced uh, a state of emergency. So that's just a brief uh, timeline of how things have been progressing. Um. <clears throat> I just want to um, briefly uh, give you an idea of um, the different levels of response uh, that we we have been engaged in and will continue to be engaged in. Um, under preparedness, you know, we've left uh, prepare the initial preparedness behind. You know, that happened in in, in the beginning uh, month of January when we were uh, began to do education, prevention, increasing awareness about what was going on in in Asia and other parts of uh, the world. Uh, we activated the incident management team so we could really organize uh, the work in a cohesive and uh, comprehensive way. Um, then we moved to level one response. Um, when we had the first case, and um, the goals of that level uh, of response, um, you know, were to stop transmission and spread, which we did with the first case by doing good contact investigation and making sure that uh, no one was exposed to uh, COVID-19, and we enhanced emergency response mechanisms um, and um, you know instituted case isolation and follow up for um, uh, people who were under investigation. And we activated crisis communication uh, strategies. Level two uh, response has been about uh, ongoing stopping transmission and the spread of COVID-19 in Boston, scaling up emergency response mechanisms uh, and provide support systems um, to um, the new cases that we got as a result of um, the Biogen uh, conference. And obviously our work has uh, increased dramatically since since March 6. Um, and we are in um, moving into level three um, response. You know, we um, would not be surprised if um, we, we, we haven't uh, documented community transmission yet in Boston. 
I know the state announced that they, they may have had some community transmission in other parts of the state, but in the city right now, we have not um, documented that. Um, so we continue to try to uh, uh, you know, implement stra uh, strategies to slow tr uh, transmission and reduce case numbers. Um, we're scaling up um, a response by implementing uh, what we call the conti continuity of operations planning, which is a plan that ensures that the business and the work of the Boston Public Health Commission and the city of Boston can continue um, in the event that we end up uh, with a large number of cases and even cases affecting the people that we rely on to do the day-to-day the, the -day work at the Boston Public Health Commission. And um, not only are we working on, on our uh, COOP plans, we're also uh, working with city government and making sure that all uh, essential uh, city services and city departments have the same uh, plan so we can always rely on those services to, to um, to serve you know, the residents of Boston. And uh, you know, we're already uh, in the face of promoting social distancing. You have seen all the cancellations that have happened. We canceled the um, um, St. Patrick's Parade uh, that was supposed to happen this weekend. Uh, a number of universities um, have uh, moved into online um, uh, teaching, and uh, a number of other events have been canceled. And, um, this all this you know is happening as in a, in, a, in a you know as an effort and as an abundance of caution to make sure that we really limit the uh, the gatherings and the opportunities for people to be in uh, close quarters and um, and and any um, infectious you know person who could be among the community to have the opportunity to spread it to to other people. Um, we are getting ready to do physical activation of our medical inte intelligence center, which a center that allows us to do um, all the coordination with other city departments um, and allows us to, to um, uh, respond, you know, 24-7 to, to, you know, new and emerging issues. And, you know, the um, objectives of the work we're doing right now is to continue to manage our response, you know, the commission's response to COVID-19. Um, help maintain situational awareness for in the uh, incident, incident management team and other planning partners, provide public health and clinical guidance to internal and external partners, create and disseminate public information to residents and media, uh, continue to conduct activities to, to minimize and stop any potential transmission of COVID-19 in the city, coordinate our, and provide resources to support uh, response operations and conduct activities to meet human services needs related to COVID-19. Um, this is a, a, a list of our ongoing um, response efforts. Um, we're, um, City of Boston, uh, we're doing City of Boston coordination, including uh, working closely with the Office of Emergency Management, which is our city partner who's gonna help us um, be able to respond uh, and access all the services and resources um, that residents may need at some point um, from other from other city departments. We uh, are, you know, doing coordination with healthcare partners and providing technical assistance and guidance. You know, through conference calls, we have a network of um, healthcare providers, and we uh, we have a two way communication going on where we continue to. Uh, share information and also gather information about how hospitals and he healthcare partners are uh, gearing up to respond. And in the event that um, we end up with uh, you know, a, a large number of cases in the city of Boston, um, we'll be there to support uh, the hospitals and help them get uh, the support they need, again, through, through city government and city resources. We're doing community engagement. We've done a number of uh, um, events where we've uh, brought information and answered questions for residents um, in, in particular areas and um, continue to do pu daily public health mes messaging and press communication uh, and using social media to get um, the word out about everything that's going on. And we've continued to work with our Boston EMS and public safety um, in, in coordination and preparedness and we're in daily communication with our partners at DPH and CDC 
uh, and um, getting clinical guidance and really an aligning the work and our response with uh, the work that the State Department is doing as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rita. Now I would like to introduce Professor Ron uh, Corley, who is the director of the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratory, known as the Needle, and also professor and chair of the Department of Microbiology at the Boston University School of Medicine. His research focuses on the immune consequences of infections to highly infectious viruses, but today, he's going to be speaking to us about what we do know and what we don't know about this very new virus, uh, COVID-19. Professor Corley, may I invite you to the stage? Thank you, Pat, <clears throat> and good afternoon. So <clears throat> we're talking about this new coronavirus, and this is really um, we're only two months into the discovery of this virus. Uh, the reality is, is that we were, uh, WHO was notified on the 31st of uh, December of last year that there was a new type of pneumonia that was circulating. There were 27 people in uh, Wuhan, China that had been identified with this. And within a very short period of time, on the 8th of January 2020, as, as announced in ProMed, uh, this new virus had been discovered. Uh, they discovered a coronavirus, and they had put the entire genome of the coronavirus out on the web so that immediately uh, people could start uh, developing uh, therapeutics uh, and vaccines and trying to compare it with uh, the different viruses that we already knew, but also to develop diagnostic kits. So this is uh, what the coronavirus looks like. The top figure on the left uh, is the picture that showed up in the first publication uh, that it has these spike proteins. You see a EM below that, a very uh, nice electron micrograph of what coronaviruses look like. So comparing the two, it's very clear um, that this was a coronavirus. Coronaviruses have a number of different uh, proteins. They generally have either four or five structural proteins. This particular virus, like SARS and like MERS, has four uh, different structural proteins, which includes the spike, which is the protein that associates with the cellular receptor, uh, an envelope protein, a membrane protein, and the nucleocapsid, uh, which encompasses the genomic uh, RNA molecule. It's a plus-stranded, single-stranded RNA uh, virus. These are uh, enveloped viruses, so they have a lipid bilayer membrane which comes from the cell what they have infected. This is a large, a very large number of uh, viruses. They're very big as far as RNA viruses uh, go. There are four genera called alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Uh, two of these are known to infect humans, alpha and beta, and these coronaviruses have been known since the 1960s and <clears throat> two of them are known to cause what they call the common cold, uh, are frequently found in common colds along with some other types of viruses. Two of them cause mild respiratory uh, disease. And so it was very surprising the first time that SARS emerged to find out that there was a coronavirus, which everyone had thought was a pretty benign uh, viral disease, that had a uh, case fatality rate of 9 to 10 percent, uh, caused severe uh, disease. Uh, and then a few years after that, uh, the MERS coronavirus was identified. And the MERS coronavirus is uh, found in the, uh, in the Middle East and the Arabian Peninsula, and uh, it has a case fatality rate that's higher than even SARS. Now, both of these viruses, <clears throat> were kind of the predecessors to what we know about what was then called the 2019 novel coronavirus. These are thought to have arisen in humans as a result of zoonotic events uh, by a spillover uh, event. <clears throat> SARS-CoV was <clears throat> subsequently shown to be a bat virus. 
which is thought to have infected a palm civet, uh, which then infected a single human from which the, uh, 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 the uh, epidemic uh, began. MERS coronavirus also uh, was thought to have arisen in bats and is now circulating in dromedary camels. Uh, so both of these are zoonotic diseases, so of course one of the things that you want to do with the sequence when you have it of a new SARS coronavirus is to find out what is it related to. And this is a family tree. Um, you don't, I don't expect you to read this, but just look at the different colors. The yellow are the known human SARS coronavirus that infected a number of uh, people. As you can see, it's related to what's called SARS-like coronaviruses. Most of these are bat viruses. They're bat SARS viruses that have been isolated over a number of years. The uh, virus that became known as SARS-CoV-2 is uh, in a slightly different branch uh, of the, of, of the um, SARS-like viruses. It's also uh, closely related to, uh, uh, to bat viruses, but different bat viruses from the SARS coronavirus. And it's also very highly homologous with the virus that's been isolated or viral sequences that have been isolated from an animal called a pangolin. And so the minute I heard this, of course, I went to Google and figured out what is a pangolin. It was something I had not heard of before. Uh, but this is the type of bat that is known to harbor uh, coronaviruses, including viruses that are very similar to those uh, that uh, uh, gave, are thought to have given rise to the SARS-CoV-2. Um, <clears throat> so as far as, uh, as, as many as three years earlier, a bat coronavirus, it turns out to be 96% identical uh, to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 had been identified already in, in bats in a, in a cave in Yunnan. And then, um, uh, so the question is, are these bat viruses or these pangolin viruses, and where did this come from? And that's still an un unknown question. Where did this particular virus come from? But it's pretty clear that it came up as a, as a spillover event, probably a spillover event into a single individual, because the first three uh, cases of, uh, that were identified turn out to have sequences that are highly homologous, vary only by five uh, amino acids uh, when translated, and therefore almost certainly came from a single um, donor. Now, <clears throat> when you look at this virus versus SARS, so the original SARS and then the SARS-CoV-2, there was a piece of information that really caught my attention when I saw it graphed out. This is the acceleration after uh, the discovery of individuals who had what we now call COVID-19 um, versus those that, um, that uh, had SARS. If you notice in the SARS cases, the SARS cases trickled along to a large extent because we were able to identify it early. We were able to apply public health uh, constraints to the virus, limit contacts, identify people, uh, and we basically snuffed it out in a relatively short period of time because, I think, of, of our ability to apply good public health uh, conditions to them. Now, if you look at the SARS-CoV-2, uh, the individuals that have the COVID-19 disease, what you see is a rapid acceleration of that particular type of disease <clears throat> uh, to 30,000 patients before we even had... Uh, uh, 2,000 in the case of SARS. Now this could be because it had been circulating before we actually knew uh, it was there and the public health response had been uh, assimilated, but it could also be uh, due, due to differences in transmission dynamics. So for example, SARS-CoV has been shown to have relatively modest viral loads in the respiratory tract, which peaks about 10 days after the symptoms emerge. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, there are very high viral loads that are found soon after symptoms develop uh, and that are about the same level of patients that are further along in disease. And so there's a chance that this virus actually is uh, more transmissible early on even when people are asymptomatic, which is one of the major concerns in trying to uh, uh, deal with this virus and to uh, identify it. 
which can't be done without good diagnostics. So <clears throat> if you look at the genome of coronaviruses, uh, these genomes vary in size and they also vary in the number of genes that are present uh, in them. So in addition to the four uh, structural genes which I've already mentioned, there are a large number of genes which we call non-structural genes. These aren't part of the, of the virus structure itself that seem to be divided into a, what classical virologists will call essential and non-essential um, uh, genes. The essential genes are those that are absolutely required for the virus to be able to infect a cell. The non-essential genes aren't required for infecting cells, but they may be required for uh, are involved in the pathogenicity of the particular virus. So <clears throat> these types of, of genes are in fact involved in uh, adapting the cellular environment to a virus. Uh, the, have they have proteases in them? They have immune modulators. They block the immune response um, uh, very early on to the infection with these viruses, and then they're probably involved in the pathogenicity of them. So <clears throat> there are many questions, and I think as we learn more, there are going to be many more questions that uh, we don't know the answer to. But first of all, why do different coronaviruses vary in, trans, uh, in transmission dynamics and disease pathogenesis? We don't know the answer to that. We don't know if this, these differences are really due to the virus itself or are they immune-mediated uh, responses to the virus that lead to some of the disease pathogenesis uh, differences. What are the age and gender differences in response to these viruses? And I think you'll hear more about uh, some evidence that there are differences depending on the age of the individual that uh, uh, is infected. What is the role of the non-structural genes in infectivity and disease pathogenesis? These are areas that we're very um, uh, interested in. And then <clears throat> what are the correlates of immunity? Following an infection, are people truly um, uh, immune to the virus? And if so, what are the major components of immunity? Are they T-cell? Are they antibody-mediated? Can we use that as evidence to try to develop a long-lasting vaccine uh, to the virus? Because there are different disease outcomes, uh, somewhere between uh, around 15 percent of the individuals who get this have very severe disease. Are there uh, biomarkers that we can use very early on in the disease process to uh, um, predict what the disease outcome might be so that we might uh, uh, use the appropriate patient care for those individuals? Uh, <clears throat> how do you test candidate therapeutics and vaccines? What are the best model systems to study uh, for looking at candidate therapeutics and vaccines and how do we test them? in a preclinical sense before we apply them to humans. Um, <clears throat> as I've already alluded to, is there a natural reservoir of SARS-CoV-2? And finally, and it's something that concerns me uh, a lot, is that I don't think we've been, as a, as a globe, have been particularly proactive in response to this pathogen X, and I'd like to know that if, uh, how we can use the lessons that we've learned from here to uh, really respond better to the next pathogen X that comes on the scene. And this is going to require that we use uh, rapidly develop and deploy diagnostic kits in a much more robust way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, I would now like to uh, ask uh, Dr. David Hamer to uh, come up to the podium. Let me first introduce you to uh, Dr. Hamer. He is an infectious disease physician and professor of global health and medicine at the Boston University uh, School of Medicine. His research focuses on uh, a large number of infectious diseases globally and he currently heads up the GeoSentinel surveillance network that is studying emerging infectious diseases around the world. Dr. Hamer is going to build on what uh, Dr. Corley has talked about and now talk about the epidemiology of uh, COVID-19 infection, who's getting infected, what their symptoms are, and hopefully you're going to cover what to expect next. 
Welcome, Dr. Hayden. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start out um, showing a timeline of the progress of the epidemic. Um, so this is a fairly complex figure, but a, a couple things to highlight. Um, the first cases of pneumonia were identified or really linked to the Huanan seafood wholesale market, and this is probably where that crossover or you know, spillover event that Dr. Corley mentioned occurred. And then it didn't take long before they closed the, the seafood market because they recognized that was a source. But by then, there was already person-to-person -person transmission happening in, um, uh, in Wuhan and probably beyond in, in the province. Uh, subsequently, it actually was almost record time for identification of this virus. I think that when SARS broke out in 2000, late 2002 and in 2003, it took many months to identify the causative agent. And this was done within weeks to a month. And then, uh, and soon thereafter, the, the full gene sec sequence was shared, uh, diagnostic reagent development started, and, and testing started. And, um, and then it didn't take long, though, before it was recognized outside of, of, of Wuhan um, and actually you know, even outside in other provinces of China. This is a similar timeline, but it, it's more extensive. And I think the key things here is in uh, Mid-January, COVID-19 was, was basically classified as a, a Class B notifiable disease. And then just about 10 days later, the World Health Organization declared this a public health emergency of international concern. And you can see the, the rapid rise of cases um, during this time. And this is data from just uh, very recently, the last few days, the situational report from the World Health Organization. And, and you can see that there's been spread to many parts of the world. The size of the circles is basically a function of, of how many cases there have been. And obviously, there's been a lot in China, but, but there's been a large outbreak in Iran that's spread to various parts of the Middle East, Italy, um, and then increasing numbers in uh, Western Europe, as well as many other parts of the world, including the United States. So there's a lot that's been learned about the transmission of the SARS coronavirus 2. Um, we, we think it's transmitted primarily by respiratory droplet, but, but there's some questions of whether it could be airborne and potentially other mechanisms of transmission. You know, as I mentioned, the early cases were associated with the, the seafood market, but really after that it was community and, and hospital-associated cases that, that initially there was a question was, you know, this spreading person to person, but it didn't take very long before that question was answered. In fact, there's a nice study of an intrafamilial spread in Shenzhen where people had traveled to Wuhan, came back, and other members of the family very quickly became infected. And there are a number of, of other studies since. So there's no doubt that this can spread person to person. Um, the, one of the questions that has arisen, though, is can somebody who has no symptoms or is really in an early prodromal phase before the onset of more severe symptoms, can they transmit the disease? And, and that, that, that's worrisome because if they don't have symptoms and you're trying to do, say, airport-based screening or some other form of you know, public screening, you, you may, they may not have any symptoms to complain of. And, and there's, there, there are a couple studies that have come out suggesting that, that there is you know, asymptomatic transmission or very early transmission before symptoms develop. Uh, and that, that's worrisome. And as Dr. Corley said, there's also a very high viral load very early on. And, and, and some of that is in the upper respiratory tract, which can facilitate spread. Now, there have been a lot of studies trying to f define how transmissible this virus is. Um, you know, sort of one standard approach is to, to look at the basic reproductive number. And this is basically the number of people that a, a single person who's infected will infect. So if, if, if the number is 2.0, that means on average they'll infect two more people. If it's three, then they'll infect three people. Uh, there's been a couple studies looking at that, including a systematic review of, of the preliminary data suggesting that this reproductive number varies from as low as 1.4 as, as to as high as 6. But most of the studies have suggested 2 to 3, which is fairly infectious. I mean, this, this can lead to, f if, if there aren't control measures, it could lead to a virus running through a community in more than half and as many as two-thirds of a population becoming infected in the absence of pre-existing immunity. Clinically, the incubation period is pretty well defined now. Most individuals who develop symptoms will develop symptoms within four to five days, maybe six days, in sort of on, you know, on average, um, with a range from as little as two days to up to 12 days for most cases. 
This is a, an illness with a, a wide variety of manifestations. There may be very low-grade illness with, um, and, and potentially asymptomatic carriage and shedding and then recovery, a mild illness that's, that's characterized by you know, sort of typical upper respiratory tract symptoms with a runny nose, sore throat, cough, you know, muscle aches, and headache. Um, but it's really this, the more severe disease that's worrisome because this, this can uh, be manifested by you know, fever, dry cough, and difficulty breathing, but that can lead to severe respiratory distress. Uh, a number of laboratory findings that are really are not specific um, but, but are, are relevant because they're, they're fairly typical of severe viral infections, including a low white blood cell count and particular low lymphocyte counts. And then inflammatory markers, nonspecific inflammatory markers are typically elevated. So one important thing is who is at risk? And there's this Chinese CDC has already um, published a large case series in their CDC weekly of more than 44,000 patients. Some of the risk factors that have come out in, in this large compilation as well as some of the smaller case series are um, advanced age, underlying medical conditions, you know, cardiac disease, pulmonary disease, diabetes mellitus, and so forth, and certainly, you know, anyone who's immunocompromised all are at greater risk. Um, and of course, healthcare workers, and we have to keep in mind that, you know, healthcare workers are really the front line and, and were at very high risk during the early SARS outbreak. Um, there's an age-related increase in confirmed cases, so most of the cases have been in adults over the age of 30. Um, with higher rates in older adults. And most importantly is the case fatality rate from China um, varies by age. And you can see the, the, the graph inset there. I mean, overall, from this large data set, they found a case fatality rate of 2.3%. But, but as one becomes older, the risk uh, for somebody who's 70 to 79 is 8% and almost 15% for 80 plus. So this is a very dangerous disease for elderly and those with medical conditions. So one question is, what is really the true case fatality rate? And it's always hard when you have a moving target with a rapidly advancing epidemic to, to, to really define what the, the exact denominator is. There are a number of different case series that have been published already from China, uh, suggesting rates of you know, 1.4 to 4% of people who are infected dying. Um, but notably, data from just the last few days from South Korea suggests a much lower uh, case fatality rate of 0.6 percent. There, there are a lot of reasons why. I mean, first of all, early case series um, from China included a, they really enriched for sicker people. They may not have been testing those with mild symptoms, um, and, and so that the denominator is, you know, maybe missing some of the milder cases. Uh, also, their case definitions have evolved. I think they've had two changes to the case definition over time. And then there's a problem of a lag between the initial diagnosis, the time of confirmation of infection, and then final outcome. And this, this exemplifies that, showing that what some of the initial case fatality rates were based on were really the, the fatal and severe disease, because those are the groups that are being tested, whereas the mild or, or minimally symptomatic cases um, may not have been tested um, in China, but in South Korea, they've really scaled up testing, and I think that that may explain to some extent why the case fatality rate there appears to be lower. So how does this virus compare to other um, coronaviruses and then pandemic influenza? I put together this table to try and highlight it. So there are more than 110, maybe 120,000 cases so far. Uh, the number has been steadily increasing each week. The reproductive number, so the number of cases that an individual can spread to, to other people, is, is in the range of two to three. And then the case fatality rate is, is anywhere from something less than 1% to as high as two to 3%. The original SARS coronavirus that uh, caused the outbreak in 2003 ended at 8,000 cases, had a, a similar estimated um, in sort of uh, reproductive number, so a similar rate of spread, but had a much higher case fatality rate. Fortunately, it was a much smaller epidemic. The Middle East uh, Respiratory um, Syndrome coronavirus, which still is causing a smoldering outbreak in the Middle East, has a similar uh, uh, degree of transmissibility, but a much higher case fatality rate. In contrast, the pandemic H1N1 influenza that caused an outbreak in 2009 um, went global, and it was estimated to infect about 200 million people. The, the reproductive number you see for this is lower, though, so it wasn't as easily transmissible, and yet, you know, look at the, the, the size of the numbers. I mean, more than 200 million estimated infections. 
Uh, fortunately, the case fatality rate for that was much lower, but when you end up with millions of cases, even if it's 0.1%, you still have a lot of deaths. Um, this, this is trying to put it in perspective relative to, to other diseases. So, so the, the x-axis shows the estimated uh, reproduction number, then the, the y-axis uh, case fatality rate. And you can see that this is sort of in the middle. Something like measles has a very high transmissibility rate, um, but MERS or Ebola have a very high case fatality rate. Um, and again, these are all you know, sort of, this is a moving target in terms of defining what the exact case fatality rate and transmissibility is. Um, there are a lot of additional questions. Are there other routes of transmission? Uh, can it be spread uh, by, by the airborne route? Um, there's an article, a preprint of an article that came out just today suggesting that the virus can uh, linger in, in an aerosol for up to three hours and, and after you know, somebody's infected persons in a room. A uh, question of can it be spread through the feces? There's a small proportion of patients in the, in the study so far, two to three percent on average, have had diarrhea, uh, both PCR and culture positive for the virus. Um, are there super spreaders? So with the SARS epidemic, we, there were some individuals that spread it to many, many other people. Um, we don't know if that's happening with this new coronavirus. Obviously, I've already talked about the, the actual case fatality rate, which we'll have a better feel for with time. Is co-infection with other viruses or bacteria possible? Seasonal influenza, one of the sort of dangerous parts of it is it often leads to a, a severe pneumonia complicated by a secondary bacterial infection. Um, immunity, we don't know anything about it. You know, will somebody who recovers from an episode be completely immune? If so, for how long? Um, um, and you know, can they become reinfected after a period of time? And then one that issue that's that's a really complicated issue is children appear to have very few symptoms and not to get very sick from this virus, but can they serve as a reservoir in the community? And there's, there's two different studies, one from China and then some preliminary data from France that suggest that might be possible, but it has, that has implications for closing schools. And then another is, you know, will transmission slow or stop during warmer summer months? So I'll stop there. These are just a couple pictures from some recent travel showing airport screening. Um, which, due to the lack of symptoms in some cases, may not be that effective an approach. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, David. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Nahid uh, Bedalia, who is an infectious disease physician and an associate professor at, uh, of medicine at the Boston University uh, School of Medicine. She is also the director of infection control at uh, the National Emerging Infectious Disease Laboratories, The Needle. Her research focuses on TB, uh, HIV, and malaria. And of note, uh, Nahid uh, actually worked in Sierra Leone uh, during the uh, outbreak of Ebola uh, a few years ago and has recently been working in the Democratic Republic of the Congo um, uh, on uh, the uh, Ebola outbreak there. She will be speaking to us today on public health aspects of COVID-19 and emergency preparedness. Nahid, please. You can tell I'm a frontline healthcare worker because I still have my hospital ID on me right now. Um, so I uh, thank you for that introduction. I, I'd like to take a, a step, a deeper dive into some of the issues that both Ron and uh, Dr. Nieves and, and David have talked about, but really look at the healthcare facility uh, perspective of this disease and how hospitals around the United States are, are thinking about this disease. Um, I want to start with this. This is very small text, but I wanted to put this quote up there and start with this because this is this quote from a colleague of mine, Dr. Ashish Shah, who's the director of the Harvard Global Health Institute, expresses the worst fears that healthcare workers and hospitals sort of feel right now. And that is this. Some of the best epidemiologists in this world are estimating that between 40 and 70 percent of adults will end up getting an infection with COVID-19. Even if we begin with that low number, end up with 40% of adults in Massachusetts, that's 2 million people getting infected. If we take that data and say, say 
uh, from China and say about 20% of people needed hospitalizations, that's about 400,000 hospitalizations. Even half, uh, even if we said no, that's too many, we gotta cut that in half, that's 200,000 hospitalizations. At any given time in Massachusetts, we think there are 3,000 to 4,000 hospital beds open at most. So if you start doing the numbers, you very quickly realize that you do not have anywhere near capacity to take care of tens of thousands of COVID patients who might need hospitalizations. But if we spread it, spread it over many, many, many months, and ideally a year, I think we have a shot at being able to take care of everybody who needs care. So what Dr. Jha is referring to is this idea. This is a wonderful um, graphic that's from the CDC and The Economist. It's talking about, um, it's not just the total number of cases that we might expect from this disease. It is how at this point we mitigate uh, through ability to sort of make sure that everybody does not get the infection at the same time. And if they, they, they do not and actually then appear to healthcare on a periodic basis, we're able to provide them with much better care, um, quicker care, um, while keep our, keeping our healthcare workers safe. So what are hospitals and healthcare facilities sort of thinking of right now as they're preparing for this across Massachusetts, but also across the country? One thing I'll tell you is that, you know, for those of us in the United States who are doing this from, from Seattle to California to Massachusetts, this is a real time experience. Um, I do not even have references for you because it's an experience that we're currently living. We're building on experiences that we had from H1N1, from Ebola, uh, but this is a slightly different disease. Um, the principles are similar, though, um, and so the first of this is to ensure that we differentiate between those who actually need inpatient level of care and those who do not, which is by which I mean we need to decrease the number of people who may not require care from coming into crowded emergency rooms and crowded clinics. The first step a lot of doctors, uh, nurses, and healthcare facilities are doing is, is keeping, trying to keep people healthy even more than usual, really encouraging um, you know, that people can do everything on, on their side at home uh, to stay healthy, refilling their medications. Um, then hospitals are you know, uh, deploying strategies such as telehealth and telemedicine um, to get in touch with patients who might be at higher risk, um, who may have clinics appointments coming up or, or who may need check-in to ensure that they're staying healthy or that um, if we check in on them and we find that maybe they do not need to come into clinic or they're not sick enough to potentially come to the emergency room, they're able to take good care of themselves at home. We're also working, um, most of the hospitals are also working very quickly on identifying patients who do come to care that may be suspect or confirmed COVID-19 patients. And a part of that means we screen patients who present to our facilities, we test them, and we quickly isolate them, separating them from everybody else who's in the hospital. Now, that might seem simple, but the difficulty of this is the early symptoms, as David mentioned, in this disease are like any other disease. So unless, um, for now, we have potentially the, the link that many of these patients may be linked uh, to other exposures, to, to other conditions, but that may change. We might get, if we get growing number of community transmission cases, we may not be able to discern someone who just presents with regular symptoms of, of influenza, for example, currently, who may be COVID-19 or not. And this is where the testing bit becomes so important. Um, the, currently, the, the testing is de deployed in, 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 in every state in the United States. The capacity for testing, though, is, is just ramping up. Um, as this ramps up, it's going to allow us to quickly then differentiate somebody who comes in with very common symptoms and, and be able to isolate them, um, as I talked about. The other aspects that we're working on is, well, what do you, what do, you do if you do get a large number of people at the same time? We're working on surge capacity, and that has a few different aspects. It has physical resources, it's, it has to do with space, and it has to do with people. Um, and part of that is ensuring that we identify spaces within our own hospitals where large numbers of people with infectious diseases can be taken care of. Um, we're also identifying strategies in which we pull in more staff so that we have more cadres of backup. And I'll talk a little bit about healthcare workers in a second. We're also investing a lot of energy on keeping healthcare workers staff, uh, healthcare workers safe, and I'll, I'll talk about about healthcare versus healthcare workers specifically on the next slide. But this is this is a critical point in our strategy, and I'll explain why. We're managing supply chains to make sure that we have everything that we need. 
Um, the difficulty here is we currently don't know, and I was hoping David, David would have told me how long this epidemic is going to go on. Um, if I knew that this was going to go on for three months, I would know how to plan around those logistics. If I knew what the supply chain for the rest of the country looked like, I would have a better idea how to plan on this. But not knowing that, most hospitals are trying to take their best guess on a smaller pool of pa pa patients presenting, but also under the conditions that this might be a much longer epidemic with many patients. Um, we're also changing our procedures, procedures and flows to reduce chances of transmission within the hospital. Um, if anybody comes in, most area hospitals you will now see if anybody comes in with viral respiratory symptoms, there's a specific check-in to allow um, patients to, to go there first to make sure that they don't need to be evaluated potentially for COVID-19. And we're, we're looking to decreasing the number of visitors at any one time, um, ensuring that um, we're, the people who come in to visit their loved ones are healthy themselves and are not potentially putting uh, the patients who are admitted, including their own family members, at risk. So speaking of, of healthcare workers, and, and uh, D Professor Hibbard uh, talked about this a little bit. I was deployed um, during uh, the West African epidemic for Ebola, and um, Healthcare workers were the most critical resource in that epidemic, and I think that from every epidemic, when we look at it, they become the linchpin because they are the interface between the community and the hospital. And, and so the, we are duly at risk. We are at risk from potentially working with confirmed and suspected patients, uh, but we're also po a population that exists with everybody else within the community. And in, in this setting where this might be a, a larger epidemic that impacts people in the community and in the hospital, um, this becomes, a, healthcare workers in specific, and the safety of healthcare workers in specific becomes very important. Um, so we are working on like everybody else, I think, is we're planning, there's no PPE shortages currently, but we are planning that if there are, how do we sort of work around that? How do we, in, in, you know, um, ensure that the national supply chains and such are working out? We're also dealing with coming up with more um, foreign policies on how do we deal with sick healthcare workers? How do we deal with suspected illnesses in healthcare workers? Um, everybody who's currently sick is, is, is recommended to stay home, just like any uh, guidance for anybody else in any other field. Uh, we're, in, we're ensuring that there's balancing with enough staffing and that we have sick call for people who might get sick, sick and then more backup for those people who might get sick. And the reason this is important is, think about it this way, even if it's a mild illness, we know from this and, and David's, we know from epi studies and David's presentation that 80% of the people who get this get mild disease. So if 80% of healthcare workers get mild disease, they still have to stay home while they're sick. Um, and so we have to plan around potentially providing staffing for a longer period of time with a larger group of people with the condition that some of the healthcare, healthcare workers may get sick from community transmission or potentially in, in the worst case scenario in the hospital setting. We're also working to provide constant communications with our staff. Um, you know, policies and, and situations are changing. It seems almost hourly and, and certainly changing weekly when it comes to guidance from the CDC and others. And so how do we make sure that our healthcare workers and, and facilities all are able to keep up with that evidence um, as the science is changing? And then as we do for our patients, we're working on psychosocial support and putting in those safety nets for healthcare workers and, and others. There are some remaining questions that you know we are, um, sorry for the typo here, uh, we are looking at particularly at the continuity of care interface between hospitals and community, right? So um, what patients can, so majority of the patients if, if they have mild illness will probably be asked to stay at home. Um, but what about patients who get better but are not 100% yet um, well enough, but they could be taken care of at home? The considerations that we're looking at are who are these patients that could be potentially discharged home to be taken care of? And then high-risk populations that cannot take care of themselves, do not have a home to go to. So uh, whether it's elderly or, or, um, or a homeless population or long-term facility residents, um, those who might have active substance abuse issues, um, we're, there's, a, there's a whole conversation between hospitals and each of these different facilities on the outside about how to maintain a continuity, continuity of care and provide the best care possible to those populations. Then there are questions about when, when can our healthcare workers come back to, to work? Um, 
what is the return to work policy? Um, currently, if your symptoms are, if you're not a COVID patient, and you're sick with a respiratory uh, illness, uh, you come back when your symptoms are, are, are improved and have ended. Um, what if um, you have a, well, what about this? What if you have a multi-generational family? You're well, you're an adult who does well, you have a mild illness, but you have to go home and you're a caretaker for somebody who's elderly in your home or you have children. Um, I think that the, this is more falls into public health realm, but I think hospitals are having to deal with, you know, um, just the care within the household as well. Um, so I'll end there and um, and just say I, I, I think in the end the, the biggest advice and, and thought that I have is, you know, for majority of us, this illness will likely be mild. The, the issue ends up being that we want to protect those within our community, the percentage that might get sicker, though those we have who have advanced age or medical comorbidities, we want to keep our loved ones who fall into that category safe. And that's where mitigation and, and personal responsibility and preparedness comes into play. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nahid. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Professor Wendy Mariner uh, to the podium. Uh, she is the uh, sorry Edward R. Utley Professor of Health Law at the Boston University School of Public Health. Her research focuses on laws governing health risks, including uh, population health policy. And she's going to be speaking to us today on the ethics of quarantining and potentially other issues, too. Thank you very much, Professor Hibbard, and thanks to all our speakers who've laid the excellent groundwork um, for all of this discussion. I, I think that um, my role is really to talk about how we are functioning from the perspective of the public and therefore what public policy ought to be. Um, uh, at the moment, there seems to be some confusion as to what public policy ought to do. Uh, noted Judy Rovner's tweet that this, there was an actual dump, a dumpster fire uh, not far from the White House, and we're all struggling with how to respond, the public in particular. Uh, but there are many things that we do know about how to make it possible for people to function in this era of uncertainty about what, where the virus is going. Um, all the various infection rates that seem to be evolving and we're getting a handle on it, but not, not absolutely certain. We do know some things about measures like social distancing, how it works and uh, what it takes for um, people to make them work. And the first two, I think, are key foundations for any kind of response, and that is a credible source of information that the public can trust. They really need to have information that is grounded in science and about which there is not a great deal of dispute or controversy. But second, and this is really important, uh, people need the resources that make it possible to comply with reasonable public health recommendations. So how do we make it possible? Well, I think there are three categories of policy and legal issues that uh, need to be addressed. Financial protections, health services and health insurance concerns, um, and community and social services. So let me look at each one of these. Um, the lists within each category are fairly long, but let me give you a few examples. Um, one of the concerns about compliance with recommendations about social distancing is the ability of people to actually stay home. Uh, this is critically important. It's a wonderful recommendation, but not everybody can stay home, particularly those who are at or near the poverty level um, and who live paycheck to paycheck. They may want to stay home, but they may not be able to afford to stay home. So we need to think very carefully about providing job security and financial protection to people in these circumstances. We need paid leave for people who stay home, and they're only about 10 states in the District of Columbia that have um, paid leave required for 
their population. Massachusetts is one. However, not all paid leave laws uh, cover staying home when you are not sick. They cover staying home when you are sick um, or under a doctor's care or taking care of a family member who might be sick. In Massachusetts, um, you can have 40 hours of paid sick leave. And that won't quite cut it for a 14-day uh, stay-at-home self-quarantine. Interesting phrase, you know, self-quarantine. Um, it really means voluntarily staying at home. Uh, but it's, it's come into use. Uh, not everybody would qualify for paid sick leave anyway, not just those who are in the states that don't require it, but people who are not employed as employees. We have about 30% of the private workforce that is are really consists of independent contractors, self-employed people. Think of Uber drivers, gig workers, um, freelancers, large numbers of people, estimates range from 20 to 40 million, that would be self-employed and therefore you know, not eligible for any paid leave. Um, so they need some kind of protection because if they don't go to work, they don't get paid. And if they don't get paid, then they may not pay the rent or the utility bill um, or, get, or buy food. So we do need some kind of income protection for these people in order to enable them to stay at home, uh, have social distancing um, that, that we have recommended they may wish to do. Uh, if we don't have full income replacement, we might encourage, should encourage, uh, deferral or suspension of rent payments, utility payments, things like that that would enable people to stay home when they're not receiving a paycheck and therefore can't afford uh, to pay their bills. Uh, suspension of evictions for people who can't pay the rent when they're staying home and not getting paid. Uh, you know, suspension of uh, utility shutoffs when people stay home and aren't getting paid. Um, meanwhile, you have people who are not employed and therefore not not getting paid, but they are uh, they they are they are receiving benefits. Retirees who receive Social Security, people with uh, serious disabilities who are receiving disability benefits, uh, people of very low incomes who are receiving benefits through TANF, SNAP, WIC, and the like. Um, these benefits need to be protected and coming in order to enable people like this to continue to s survive financially. Uh, so we need to protect the uh, organizations and agencies that are providing these, um, these benefits. Now, the small businesses need some help, too. Uh, the, I know that the White House has proposed protecting or providing some assistance to the airline industry and the hotel industry, interestingly. Um, but what is needed really is the small business protection for these uh, small organizations that really are operating at, uh, at the, on the margin with revenues who are having trouble paying for their employees. And if they lose a few, uh, won't necessarily be able to stay in business um, at, at all. Now, the bill in Congress to provide $8.3 billion for uh, the coronavirus emergencies has, includes $20 million for the Small Business uh, Administration's Disaster Loans Program. Uh, but it's not clear that that will be enough. $20 million may not cover the number of small businesses in this country that are uh, struggling at the moment. And it takes a lot of time to fill out an application, uh, have it processed and the like in, in this time, even if this gets implemented. What they probably need more than loans, since they may be losing money, are grants rather than loans. Uh, second category, no, I'm not getting the next slide. Is there a way to do that? No. <laughs> we 
have a technological emergency. Uh, the, well, in any event, uh, the second category has happily been well introdu introduced by the, all of the speakers that you've heard so far. <laughs> uh, which has to do with, oh, now it's even worse. Um, <clears throat> it has to do with the health and human services and health insurance. It is displaying? On the live stream, yeah. Oh, good. Well, good. So we will now have. All right, so it's fine. Uh, if it's displaying on the live stream, I apologize for the delay. Uh, the second category of uh, protections that we need to think about are those dealing with health services and health insurance. Um, we've had an excellent discussion of the need for testing, uh, for lab capacity, for uh, testing capacity, because these are the kinds of things that urgently are needed in order to assess patients, assess uh, in people who may need to know whether or not they need to stay home or they need medical care. Now, the FDA does have authority uh, to rapidly approve new tests that are developed by state and, and private entities, and they, and they can do that fairly quickly. Um, although they have uh, did not do so originally, but are doing it, I think, working on it now. The emergency coronavirus bill, again, in Congress uh, adds $61 million for FDA salaries and $3.4 billion for the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund to buy therapeutics, but of course we need to have therapeutics to buy. We need to have the vaccines to buy. Um, I'm recalling Dr. Redalia's discussion of the, the stress on hospitals, primary care doctors, emergency departments, uh, particularly at this era when we have a flu season that's a fairly intense flu season, and people are admitted, um, or I'm sorry, people come to the, the physician or to the emergency department with either symptoms that could be a cold, could be seasonal influenza, could be COVID-19, could be nothing at all. Um, but how do they know? They don't know unless they can get tested. So the stress on these um, healthcare facilities is increasing. And at the same time, um, their need to care for other patients with different acute illnesses and emergencies um, continues. So it, it does indeed speak to the need for a kind of surge capacity uh, the, the physicians need to know whether they can send the patient home, um, and they have to while they await the results of a test and ask the person to self-quarantine in order to um, give them a chance to, uh, to have other patients in the limited number of rooms that they have, particularly isolation rooms. Um, now, health insurance in this, I'm sorry, health care in this country um, is usually described as access to health insurance, not just access to health care. And in order to get tested, people really need to have access to health insurance because testing is not cheap. Um, as Representative Katie Porter pointed out in a, in a, um, questioning Dr. Robert Redfield of the CDC in a congressional hearing um, using a whiteboard to tote up the elements. A test um, in the hospital could cost, on average, $1,333. This is not the kind of money that everyone necessarily has lying around. Um, if you do not have insurance, there is a clear disincentive to get tested. If you are um, an undocumented immigrant, you may have a financial disincentive to get tested if you don't have insurance, which is likely. Um, you may have a personal legal disincentive to get tested if you think you will be identified as undocumented, or if you have a family member who is undocumented um, and therefore 
have a disincentive to go to the hospital or to a clinic to get tested. This is obviously bad news for the individual and bad news for public health if the person turns out to be infected and unknowingly is spreading it to others. Um, now, health insurance in this country is, as you know, a fairly complicated system. But the Affordable Care Act at least expanded coverage to those who have care under uh, insurance under the Affordable Care Act uh, to include benefits for preventive care and for low-income people to include preventive care without cost sharing. Um, we have, however, in recent years um, encouraged the proliferation of cheaper plans which do not cover preventive care, also therefore discouraging people from getting tested and getting public health care. Uh, states that did not expand Medicaid, for example, will have a number of low-income persons who do not have private insurance because they can't afford it and are not eligible for Medicaid and therefore unlikely to get health care and unlikely to get tested. So one recommendation would obviously be to expand Medicaid um, in those states that have not uh, enacted the Medicaid expansion. Um, we have been doing the opposite, however, uh, by encouraging states to obtain waivers under Medicaid that would allow the states to impose work requirements as a condition on Medicaid eligibility. This, um, this has been in litigation and uh, the courts so far have not approved the waivers that the Department of Health and Human Services has approved. Um, but it, it has, because it will not increase the coverage under Medicaid, but it does suggest that, um, as the court discovered, in states where work requirements have gone into effect, uh, such as Arkansas, fewer people were able to maintain Medicaid coverage. 18,000 were disenrolled in Arkansas, for example, and Kentucky expected to lose uh, m many times more than that if its plan had gone into effect. It has been pulled back since then. Um, so one, another possible policy option is to uh, drop these conditions on um, eligibility for Medicaid to enable people to be covered and get the kind of preventive care that they would need and not have disincentives. Uh, in the meantime, public and private insurance benefit systems could um, suspend or eliminate cost sharing for the kinds of care that is needed for people to get tested or to get treated for COVID-19. Uh, a lot of, uh, I don't say a lot, but a number of insurers have begun to drop cost sharing requirements for um, getting tested and also to increase the availability of um, getting an appropriate supply of regular medications for people who might have to stay home and are unable to get medications. Finally, in the category of community and social services, uh, when we go back to the concept of social distancing, it may be one of the best recommendations, particularly social distancing in schools, um, but it's disruptive sometimes. If you consider school closings, for example, it's often a good idea um, because schools are often a very good place for children to transmit infections and they can bring it home and transmit it to uh, elderly grandfather or other people that they interact with. Uh, but school closings bring their own problems. Uh, schools offer free breakfast, snacks, lunches, and sometimes dinners to low-income children. Uh, families depend on this. And what happens when your school closes? Where will your children get breakfast and lunch if you can't afford it? Um, can you, if your school, if your child's school closes, 
Can you stay home to take care of the child? Can you take off work, if you're, even if you're healthy, and not staying home as a precaution, but just taking care of your child? If not, do you have affordable childcare? Uh, what happens if childcare workers are not available out of concern for interacting with people who may be infected? Some parents have left their children at the library or sent them to the movies because they had to go to work, not necessarily helping the public health uh, approach. Uh, we need the kind of community programs that can ramp up and provide either childcare services or meals and the like for children during school closings. Now we're all being advised to use Zoom or other online learning platforms to conduct school and classes when the, the institutions are closed and to protect people from getting together in large groups. Um, what about, and, and some schools in the secondary and primary school level are providing their students with computers to take home so they can do distance learning. But what about kids that uh, don't have Wi-Fi at home, don't have internet at home? What about kids that don't have a home? What do we do about kids in shelters? What do we do about adults in shelters? How do we protect them uh, when we don't have uh, a way to keep them separate without putting them out on the street? And for that matter, group homes, especially nursing homes, um, but any kind of institution in which we already group people for particular kinds of services. And of course, a great place to group people, a sort of mainland cruise ship, is a prison or a jail uh, where transmission of many different kinds of uh, diseases is easy to do. Well, we, could, we also have the court system, our judicial system that is probably is going to have to stay functioning for at least the most essential kinds of services, um, as well as the administrative agencies that provide essential services such as Social Security um, and the benefits operations. And we're in an election season, right? How do we hold campaigns without large crowds? And in particular, how do we conduct our elections? What happens if this is continuing in November and uh, we're asked not to vote or to suspend the election or to delay it. Perhaps we're better off going back to paper ballots, which are both more reliable and can be audited, and allow people to vote without the worry of touching an electronic screen during an epidemic. Um, Again, these are just the kinds of contingency plans that we need in order to sort of survive a epidemic when social distancing is the major recommendation that can be provided. Um, so let me conclude with just the conception that I have of this whole problem. Um, thinking about emergencies as exceptions to the rule, that's what they are by definition, uh, there are conditions that disrupt or overwhelm our normal capacities. We have to begin with understanding that the more robust our normal capacities are, the less disruption emergencies cause. So bringing us to the core public health belief that social determinants of health uh, are essential for creating a resilient population and the laws that govern those social determinants, the laws governing housing, health insurance, uh, health facilities, um, income, work, et cetera, those are the kinds of laws that establish our normal capacities. So the laws and programs that support more robust capacity in normal times should eliminate or at least minimize it certainly won't eliminate, will minimize emergency disruptions, which also means that it can protect 
challenges to the rule of law because exceptions to the rule of law can create disruptions worse than some pandemics. So if we limit exceptions to the rule of law, um, we can protect against violations of human rights as well as protect against the proliferation of a contagious disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've obviously uh, run very significantly over, but I'd like you to know that uh, clearly we have heard a range of uh, discussion that uh, is probably quite rare in uh, many settings where coro corona uh, virus, COVID-19 is being discussed. At this stage, because we are running late, we would like to allow uh, about 10 more minutes for questions, and we're interested in the questions you have. I know the panelists have had a lot of questions, but now it's your turn to ask the uh, panelists your questions. And so, uh, Meredith, do we have any burning questions? Okay, so we've covered an awful lot of topics and clearly the one nobody wants to touch is how long this is going to go on. Um, but I guess uh, the biggest question for us right now is what's the strategy for the next week or so? I mean, we feel like I think we're at a cross point. What should we be doing right now, uh, let's just worry about uh, our local uh, situation first. Anybody uh, uh, ready to help with that? Rita. I'll just say a few things about that. Um, you know, when we're thinking about um, what to do next, what decisions should we make, you know, we, we're always trying to balance um, if, find that fine line between how soon do we close, disrupt people's lives, basically. And as we know, there are social, economic implications in all the decisions um, that, that we make. So, so we're trying to, um, you know, uh, keep all those things in mind and, um, and, and trying to, to um, um, not necessarily follow what our neighbors are doing, but really let data and what's happening in Boston be the guide of the decisions we're making. And, um, you know, for example, we, we ended up closing a school, um, uh, you know, in, in, in Boston and um, in other cities in, in the United States. Um, cities have made the decision of closing the entire uh, uh, district. And so we, we didn't feel that that was necessary because we, we have not had uh, evidence as of today at 6 p.m. Uh, of uh, community transmission, but we realized that could change. You know, tomorrow I could be saying a different thing. And, uh, and again, be mindful of the disruption that these things, these decisions can, can cause in, in our residents. Um, in this case, we, um, we closed, you know, just that, that school. And, but already, and already thinking about, um, do we need to step that up? And so what are the triggers? That, that should be you know, crystal clear for us to make those decisions and, and really disrupt you know, the lives of so many families. Um, I wanted to add you know, a, a piece of good news you know, in, in the midst of all these uh, challenges. Um, our panelist was, was mentioning uh, the issue of uh, when uh, school closed and, and how disruptive it could be for, for children and families. And specifically, I wanted to give you the example of of meals and indeed, you know, Boston um, public schools serve breakfast and lunch for many children, and those end up being the main meals for some kids. So, uh, before I came here, I was informed that one of the things that BPS is doing is beginning tomorrow, they're going to be, um, uh, you know, providing uh, packages of uh, breakfast and lunch. Uh, for families that, that will be disseminated in different locations where families that have been disrupted by the, uh, you know, the closure of that school, they can come and count of meals, um, you know, uh, while the school is closed. So, you know, 
you know, all those policies that you mentioned and policy issues and questions are, are things that, that uh, we're thinking about and that uh, we're rapidly, uh, you know, putting systems and, and protocols into place so we can um, really uh, support people that are being disruptive by, by everything that's happening. Thank you. David? Yeah. So, so I, I, one of my major concerns right now is the very limited availability of tests. And, and, and the criteria that are very sort of restrictive at the present time. And you know, there may not be clear evidence of community-based transmission in our state, but there is in other states. And the, sort of the guidelines, you know, somebody's traveled to Italy or Iran or China, or if they've had contact with that person, that, you know, I think we're going to have to move beyond those very quickly and consider testing a much broader range of population, but we're not ready to do that yet. And I think there's efforts to try and rapidly scale up availability tests, but you know, if everything has to be confirmed by the CDC, it's it's really you know sort of tech, you know not a very efficient system. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, I I have heard. Uh, I don't know whether uh, you guys have heard much about this. That uh, there are uh, people offering tests, uh, you know, through. Uh, uh, completely undocumented uh, uh, sources and I just wonder if we might want to take a moment to remind people that although we are short of tests probably what is worse is to get a test that will not detect or, or appropriately uh, diagnose the coronavirus. I'll, I'll comment on that. Okay. I mean I think I think you're right and I think that's the big worry so if you have a test I mean, you need positive negative controls in a test, and if one of them doesn't work, if you have a, a false negative, you could miss a diagnosis. That person could go on to spread the disease to other family members, to coworkers. If you have a false positive, you sort of diagnose somebody that doesn't really have the disease, you put them in isolation or, or home quarantine, that's going to be very disruptive and psychologically very, very difficult for that individual. So making sure the quality of the test is good is, is really important. Um, at the same time that they're, they, they need to be scaled up, though. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Meredith? Yes, we have a question from the audience. One that's been asked a few times is, what do you all think about how this has been handled in the US versus other countries? We've just had a really good question about how uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been handled in the US versus elsewhere. Now, who's ready to jump into that one? <laughs> All right, I will, I will bite. Okay. Thank you, Nahid. So um, I think there are two aspects to this, um, and I'm, I'm actually going to be really pretty frank about this. I, I think there's been a lot of miscommunications um, at, the, at the federal level in terms of how high this, the risk to this disease is. And I think that set us behind because the way that some of the countries have done a fantastic job, like, like Singapore and some of the other countries, the way they've done it is, you know, we're all in this together. They've employed individual responsibility, everybody's responsibility to, to do social distancing, to put all these measures together. But if you can't, if you tell your population it's not even a big deal, then this is where you can't get that cooperation. We can't work together to put the mitigation and the containment into place in a timely manner. Um, so I, I think that really set us behind. I think now there's this recognition as you're seeing more cases with more tests going out, people becoming positive. The attention is being drawn to this, particularly with big events like the NCAA being, being canceled or rescheduled. Yesterday we heard about this or two days ago. This is really making the general population stop and think and look around and say, well, this is something that's happening. The second thing that I'll be a bit more frank about, I, I'm going to echo what David said. When we look back at this and we write the history of, of COVID-19, the testing is going to be one of the biggest disasters we write about. Um, I cannot stress that enough. If we had scaled this up at thousands of tests the way that some of the other countries did, we could have isolated this in particular geographical areas and then put all our mighty sort of public health resources in ensuring that those areas have the capacity and the ability to do what you'd like. Um, anybody else? I'll just say something. I'll be strength based for a minute because I do have many, many of uh, uh, things to say that are, are you know, <laughs> about all the challenges that we face, especially at the local level. But I, I, have, I appreciated the fact that 
um, fairly early in, in this process, um, uh, individuals that were traveling from the level three countries were being channeled to the 11 um, airports that had quarantine stations, and that gave us uh, a little bit of uh, wiggle room and time to start preparing and, and move from preparing to response. So I think if we have been getting, you know, I, I show that slide of how many people come to Boston every month, right, through the airport. If we had been receiving all of those flights that were coming from um, the level th three countries directly into Boston, we would have had, we would be in a completely different uh, spot right now. We would have way uh, many cases and we would have them really quickly and we would be at community transmission and we would have been closing places and, and having uh, social distancing um, decisions made, you know, a month ago probably. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so sorry. Uh, we are now out of time. As you know, we have indeed gone over, but this has truly been an extraordinary session. And I do hope you will thank, uh, the, join me thanking the speakers. But uh, just before we do uh, formally thank them, and we're, I guess we're going to have a silent round of uh, applause uh, for that. Uh, I think one of the things I've heard from many, many speakers is we must learn from this uh, event. We cannot have a repeat of this. And I do hope uh, that uh, this uh, uh, pandemic uh, does not uh, have the worst outcomes. I know we're fearful of that. Um, but it is desperately important we learn and are much better prepared next time round. So once again, I would like to thank uh, the uh, speakers and I do apologize. I know we actually now have a lot of questions. I wish we could get to all of them and uh, perhaps we'll find other ways of uh, responding to the questions. But thank you all to this wonderful expert panel. Thank you.